Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deirdre Cohen, who graduated from medical school from SUNY Downstate and then went on to complete her internal medicine residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital while Cornell. She then completed her hematology oncology fellowship at NYU, where she also earned a master's degree in clinical investigation. She previously served on faculty at the NYU Perlmutter Cancer Center, where she was also the medical director of the clinical trials office. And then Dr. Cohen joined Mount Sinai last year as associate professor in the division of hematology oncology and director of the GI oncology program for the health system and clinical trials office at the Tisch Cancer Institute. Dr. Cohen conducts research focused on immune targeted strategies and biomarker driven studies with translational endpoints and serves as principal investigators on many clinical trials pertaining to novel therapeutic approaches for patients with GI malignancies. A very warm welcome to Dr. Cohen today. Thank you, uh, Emily. I appreciate the introduction and uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for the invitation to speak today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about pancreas cancer and specifically uh, adenocarcinoma as opposed to neuroendocrine or other types of uh, cancers of the pancreas. And I'll be uh, speaking about the current challenges and some of the future directions with an eye on making the impossible possible. There we go. So this is just uh, my disclosures. Um, so the learning objectives are twofold. Uh, first, uh, we're going to uh, describe the current challenges in the treatment of pancreatic cancer, and then move on to providing evidence for emerging treatment paradigms. And here you see the outline for today's talk. Uh, first, I'll be talking about uh, incidence and mortality rates. Uh, following, I'll uh, be talking about challenges to effective therapy touching on current systemic therapy, and then rounding out with some of the uh, novel uh, treatments that are in development, as well as uh, priorities for the future. So um, the incidence of pancreas cancer world, worldwide has doubled over the last 25 years. Um, and in 2018, there were nearly 460,000 cases diagnosed. Um, certainly age is one of the um, biggest risk factors as we know that the population overall uh, is increasing um, in terms of the proportion of um, people in their sixth, seventh and eighth decades. However, um, even when you um, adjust for age, you can see that uh, the incidence is still rising with uh, five per 100,000 cases diagnosed in 1990, and that increased to 5.7 uh, per 100,000 years in 2017. So it's really reflecting the fact that there's more to it than age. And I just thought that, you know, the um, changing prevalence of modifiable risk factors such as diabetes, smoking, and obesity are playing a role, as well as the fact that we are getting a little bit better at uh, diagnosing uh, pancreatic cancer, especially in developing countries. So looking at the US specifically in uh, this year, over 60,000 new cases will be diagnosed with over 46,000 deaths. And the incidence rate is rising here in the United States anywhere between uh, 0.5 to 1% per year. Right, right now, um, pancreas cancer comprises 3% of all cancers diagnosed in the United States, but 8% of cancer deaths. And it is stage for stage, the, uh, has the lowest survival rate of any major can cancer. So like the big four, so colon, breast, and lung cancer, pancreas cancer, as I uh, alluded to, is increasing in incidence. However, unlike these four cancers, it is um, not decreasing in uh, mortality rates, but rather increasing, and it's on track to become the number two uh, cause of cancer rate related death by 2030. Um, and this is really uh, primarily because uh, advancements in uh, pancreatic cancer treatment and diagnosis are lagging behind all of the other cancers. So here you see part of the problem is the fact that uh, patients present uh, very rarely a minority of cases with uh, localized disease. Um, in general, patients are presenting with either uh, regional or distant spread. And you can see the effect that has on uh, five-year survival rates in the bottom panel. Uh, so those who present with localized disease have a 
five-year survival of 42%, and this drops down to 3% with distant disease. So looking at all comers, the overall five-year survival rate is now 10%. And while of course this uh, certainly sounds dismal, I will note that in the 1980s, this number was 4%. So there have been some small incremental uh, benefits that have been gained, but certainly uh, we haven't made a, a huge jump in the trajectory uh, of this disease. So why is that? I think, you know, there's really, it's twofold. There are clinical challenges, which as I alluded to include the late uh, and advanced presentation, you know, patients present with very vague symptoms as the pancreas lies deep in the retroperitoneum. There's also significant limitations on our current imaging modalities, and we have no adequate screening uh, tests to diagnose pancreatic cancer early. We also know that uh, pancreatic cancer has a very rapid tumor growth and metastasis. And often um, when we, we first meet uh, patients diagnosed with pancreas cancer, they're too ill um, to even uh, receive effective therapy at that time. So when patients are diagnosed at an early stage, um, even at that point, there is still a very high risk uh, of recurrence following surgery, upwards of 70%. And we know from preclinical models that pancreas cancer progression has been shown to see distant organs even before and in parallel to tumor formation at the primary site. When compared to uh, other solid tumors, there is a relative resistance to uh, conventional therapy in pancreatic cancer. And finally, uh, there are a few predictive biomarkers uh, to guide treatment, although that is changing and I'll touch on that. The other problem in pancreatic cancer are the biologic challenges. And so there's an inherent complexity um, of this tumor with complex uh, molecular characteristics, most notably KRS driver mutations, which lead to metabolic dysregulation. There's also a very desmoplastic tumor microenvironment that really can act as a true physical barrier to our treatments. And finally, uh, the microenvironment of pancreatic cancer is quite immunosuppressive with a paucity of tumor infiltrating T cells and an abundance of myeloid derived suppressor cells. So pancreatic cancer develops from pre precursor lesions known as PANINs or pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia. And PANINs um, progress in a stepwise fashion um, with the accumulation of various uh, genetic alterations. And you can see over the course of uh, their progression, they develop increasing uh, cytologic and architectural atypia as shown here on the bottom. Here you can see uh, a cartoon of the various molecular alterations in pancre pancreas cancer. And you see uh, in the green dot, the most um, commonly altered oncogene KRS in more than 90% of tumors. And then in the red uh, circles, the various tumor suppressor genes with high prevalence, including P53, CDKN2A, SMAD4, ARID1A and B, as well as the DNA damage response genes, ATM and BRCA2. But there are many other mutations with high variability and low prevalence in pancreas cancer, which eat with each tumor harboring anywhere between 60 to 80 uh, mutations, which are very different from one to the other, um, but they do seem to converge on some common pathways and processes as seen here on the right. What is very characteristic of pancreatic cancer is uh, the inflammatory context uh, in which it develops. And this is not an acute inflammation, but which, which you would see in wound healing, but rather a self-sustaining and unregulated uh, cancer cell permissive inflammation. And what's uh, interesting is that not only is inflammation a key factor, but it's actually necessary um, for pancreatic oncogenesis. Um, so KRAS mutation is not sufficient without this inflammatory context, again, highlighting um, the importance of uh, the inflammatory milieu in this disease. In addition to inflammation, desmoplasia, desmoplasia is also um, very characteristic. And in fact, pancreas cancer is one of the most stromal rich uh, cancers um, with uh, 
many times the stromal components um, far exceeding that of the cancer cells themselves. And here you see uh, histologic sections from a normal patient compared with that from a pancreatic uh, tumor. Uh, and you see the significant uh, stroma and fibrosis um, that um, is a characteristic of this disease. So here's a, a cartoon of the tumor microenvironment of the pancreas, can of pancreas cancer. And what you'll note is uh, in addition, of course, to the um, cancer cells themselves, there are many other components, including immune cells, uh, stellate cells, blood vessels, uh, microbiome, uh, including uh, um, bacteria, fungi, viruses, um, and um, blood vessels. And this, environment is really a, a dynamic entity, um, which is ever changing and is um, most notable um, to change in composition when uh, progressing from uh, a precursor panin lesion to invasive pancreas cancer. And so in the presence of oncogenic uh, mutations, these genetically epi uh, altered epithelial cells signal um, to the various components really creating a microenvironment with um, ripe for cancer progression with significant extracellular matrix, hypoxia, and uh, metabolic reprogramming, as well as immunosuppression. So with that background, you know, it's not surprising how um, the current approved uh, therapies for this disease are rather disappointing. And so when we look at sort of the treatment paradigms of pancreas cancer, they can be divided into two uh, mainstays, so surgery and systemic therapy. And I think this is really a helpful depiction to try to understand um, the, how we look at patients uh, and their tumors for candidacy for surgical resection. And it really depends on the uh, contact with uh, the major venous and arterial blood supply coursing through or behind the, the pancreas. Um, and so we characterize this as, as the tumor either um, uninvolved or abutting or encasing uh, the vasculature. And in, in clinical terms, we uh, term these patients as either resectable, borderline resectable, or locally advanced. Here you see um, a uh, sort of summary slide of the approaches to treatment in pancreas cancer based on uh, surgical resectability. And so on the left, you'll see that for those patients with uh, resectable tumors, treatment is focused on uh, multimodality therapy uh, with chemotherapy either before or after surgery. For those patients uh, with borderline or locally advanced disease, treatment is again multimodality with chemotherapy plus or minus radiotherapy with really the goal to uh, minimize the contact or, or uh, completely um, remove contact uh, of the tumor from the vessels and enable um, surgical resection. And then finally on the right uh, with distant metastatic spread, the goal is really uh, treatment with um, palliative chemotherapy to control and uh, prolong uh, overall survival. So now let's move on um, to systemic therapy for advanced pancreas cancer. And we, we, when we look back at the key developments over the last uh, 25 years in 1997 is when uh, gemcitabine was first determined to be a standard of care therapy for this disease. And this approval was uh, based on the study looking at gemcitabine compared to bifluorouracil with the primary endpoint um, of clinical benefit response, which was really a composite measure of pain, um, functional status, and weight. And you can see that compared to 5 of few, there was a significant increase in clinical benefit. There also was a modest survival benefit seen with uh, median survival of 5.6 months compared to 4.3 months. So this study uh, really set the, the, the kind of backbone for the next uh, decade in which uh, gemcitabine was then combined with uh, scores of different uh, agents, um, sort of in a me too way, um, to see if any of combination therapies um, would improve uh, single agent efficacy. And you can see gemcitabine was in, uh, 
um, looked at in combination with fluoropyrimidines, platinums, and various antibody therapies. Um, but it really wasn't until uh, uh, a decade later in 2007 with this study, uh, gemcitabine with or without erlotinib, which is an oral uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor of EGFR, where there was a statistically significant, although questionably uh, clinically significant improvement in overall survival. So the hazard ratio was 0.82, um, but median survival was only improved by two weeks. And so based on this study, the, the FDA did approve erlotinib in combination with gemcitabine. However, given uh, the, the clinically um, questionable improvement in survival, this was really never widely used in practice. And so we would have to wait until the next decade in 2011 and 2013 uh, for two pivotal studies with multi-agent uh, chemotherapy uh, where survival rates start to approach one year. And so here you see a pivotal study with fulfirinox, which is, for those who don't know, 5-fluorouracil, oxaliplatin, and arenatecan in combination of three drugs compared to gemcitabine. And what you'll see is that this really was um, quite unprecedented in the field with a median overall survival of 11.1 months with the triplet regimen compared to 6.8 months and median progression-free survival was also improved. And you know, not surprisingly, given the triplet chemotherapy, there was uh, a significant uh, increased rate of adverse events with the, with the triplet chemotherapy. However, um, when, um, they looked at uh, degradation of quality of life. This was actually uh, slower in the triplet uh, therapy uh, compared to single agent therapy, really suggesting that the improvement in symptoms from the cancer outweighed, outweighed the increased toxicity of the, the regimen. And since then, uh, modifications have been undertaken uh, to make uh, the regimen more uh, tolerable while maintaining efficacy. In uh, the other uh, pivotal multi-agent study looking at gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel uh, versus gemcitabine, this study looked at uh, uh, over 800 patients um, who were randomized to the doublet versus the single agent. And you can see that this uh, too uh, showed improved overall survival of eight and a half months compared to 6.7 months um, with an increased response rate. Uh, of 23% with the doublet compared to 7% with the single agent. So here you can see a comparison of the different adverse events with the uh, multi-agent regimens. And what I'll point out is that uh, the fulfirinox uh, regimen compared to gemcitabine led to more neutropenia, uh, fatigue, uh, neuropathy, and GI symptoms, whereas the gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel uh, led to an increase in uh, neuropathy and neutropenia. I think this is sort of a nice uh, slide to show the uh, different um, uh, outcomes and also uh, populations that were in enrolled in both of these studies. Um, and what you can see is uh, that um, the study uh, with fulfirinox was uh, conducted solely in France, whereas the uh, IMPEC study was an, an international study. You'll also note that uh, the performance status of the patients in the IMPEC study, um, they had far fewer uh, very good performance, performance status zero patients, 16%, as opposed to in the fulfirinox study with 37%. Um, they also had in the impact study uh, more metastatic disease sites, really pointing to a overall sicker uh, population in uh, the impact study. So taking the data in combination, um, both fulfirinox and uh, gemcitabine nabpaclitaxel are accepted frontline regimens um, in the treatment of metastatic pancreatic cancer. So the question, you know, clinically is, you know, how, how do we choose for our patients? And this is really based on a variety of factors um, that we uh, in, in look at, including age, uh, their functional status, 
uh, their comorbidities, and of course the patient preferences. So following um, the approval of these two multi-agent uh, therapies, there was a small pause until 2015, um, where over the past five to six years, the pace of uh, development and, and approvals of therapy has really picked up. So in 2015, nanoliposomal renotecan was uh, approved in the second line uh, treatment of pancreas cancer. And this is a novel formulation of arenatecan as shown on the left, uh, in which encapsulated drug molecules are um, in a long circulating liposome based uh, nanoparticle. And the design is really to allow for more favorable pharmacokinetic and biodistribution. And when uh, nanoliposomal arenatecan is compared to um, standard arenatecan, there's a uh, similar tumor exposure to the active metabolite SN38 at lower doses, and it also allows for prolonged tumor exposure. So here you see the study um, of nanoliposomal renotecan and 5-FU uh, compared to 5-FU, and this was in uh, advanced uh, pancreatic cancer patients who had progressed on first-line uh, gemcitabine-containing regimen, and it did meet its primary endpoint of improved overall survival with 6.1 months for the combination versus 4.2 months. And this was really a landmark study um, as the first FDA approved um, second line treatment for advanced pancreas cancer. So following approval of nanoliposomal arenatecan, um, there was a rapid um, uh, rate of approval of drugs based on precision medicine. And so, you know, I think that um, what I hope you'll take away from, from this talk is that, you know, precision medicine has really significantly altered the way we approach and treat pancreas cancer um, currently. And so, you know, with the advent of next, next generation sequencing, we can now identify very rapidly and affordably genetic alterations in tumors and then potentially match them to the ever-growing number of targeted agents that are in development. So I think this is a really interesting um, retrospective study that looked at over a thousand pancreatic cancer patients who all underwent molecular profiling with next generation sequencing. And of the uh, thousand patients, nearly 700 had outcome information. And what they found was that uh, 189 or 28% had actionable findings. And of those 189, 46 received molecularly matched therapies or targeted therapies, and 143 received unmatched therapy. And you can see that those who were matched to therapy had a median overall survival of nearly three years, whereas the unmatched uh, had a uh, overall survival of a year and a half. And so this really, uh, suggests that uh, genomic profiling can be used to identify a sizable uh, portion of the population um, for whom you know, precision medicine can make really valuable um, impacts for. So NGS efforts have uh, consistently shown uh, at least a 25%, uh, at least 25% of pancreas cancers have um, 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 highly actionable molecular uh, alterations. And as you see here, um, the uh, top ones are those that have been proven or have anecdotal clinical data in pancreas cancer. In the middle tranche are uh, proven or anecdotal evidence in, in other cancers. And then at the bottom are uh, those with promising preclinical data. And you know, this is all very exciting, but of course we do have to note that any, the prevalence of any one of these alterations is very small. So now I'd like to turn your attention to the most recent drug approvals um, for patients with advanced pancreas cancer, all of which come from identification of a genetically selected population. And these include uh, an immunogenic subtype, specifically MSI high tumors, uh, a DNA damage repair, um, uh, subtype, including BRCA1-2 uh, altered tumors, and then uh, rare genetic abnormalities, including NTREC fusions. 
So uh, the mismatch repair uh, pathway is very important in maintaining DNA replication fidelity and uh, our uh, gen genomic stability. And we know that cells with an abnormally functioning uh, pathway are not able to correct errors um, during replication. And this causes uh, an inconsistent number of nu uh, microsatellite nucleotide repeats leading to um, the instability of the microsatellite region, regions. Um, and this really reflects the condition of genetic hypermutability. Um, and there's uh, about a hundred to a thousand fold increase um, in the mutation rate in these tumors with, with uh, mismatch repair uh, defects. In pancreas cancer, uh, mismatch repair uh, deficits or MSI high tumors are found in about 1% of all pancreatic cancers. And so in early studies, looking at immune checkpoint inhibitors such as CTLA-4 and PD-1 antibodies, there was minimal to no activity seen in all comers. However, um, when, um, the, when tumors uh, with MSI high status were looked at exclusively with treatment uh, uh, with pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor, you see that of the um, six patients included in this study with MSI high, uh, tumors, uh, five of them uh, responded and all of them benefited. In another study looking at uh, MSI high tumors, there were 22 patients, so uh, you know more than three times the number in the other study. And you can see that um, there was an 18% overall response rate, which when compared to the other uh, tumors in the study was the lowest um, uh, amongst them really speaking to the fact that um, in pancreas cancer, we're probably going to need uh, ad additional therapies in combination with uh, uh, PD-1 inhibition for MSI tumors. But nonetheless, um, based on these data, pembrolizumab was approved um, and became the first biomarker-based uh, uh, treatment in pancreatic cancer. So it was a very exciting uh, approval. So now turning on to, uh, to other um, biomarkers in pancreatic cancer. Um, so uh, 17 to 25% of tumors harbor mutations in the uh, DNA damage response and repair uh, genes. And the most uh, notable include ATM, uh, BRCA, PALB2, and RAD51. And these DNA uh, damage response genes can be identified both uh, by germline testing in normal cells, as well as in uh, sequencing uh, on tumor cells themselves and for somatic mutations. And what has been recognized that, uh, is that uh, DDR deficiencies are a, a predictive biomarker to response uh, in, to platinum therapies. So on the left, you see uh, resected patients who were treated with um, platinum ther therapy broken down by uh, whether they had deficient uh, DNA damage repair uh, status versus proficient. And you can see uh, a significant improvement in survival of 3.8 years compared uh, to three years for those patients with uh, deficiency. And a similar survival advantage was seen in the advanced stage, uh, one and a half years uh, to 2.1 years. So one of the most common DDR deficiencies in pancreas cancer is BRCA mutation. And we know that about five to seven uh, percent of patients with pancreas cancer have germline BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And these mutations are enriched in um, certain populations, including Ashkenazi Jews, those who have familial pancreas cancer, as well as those who have familial breast and ovarian cancer. However, 40% of patients who are germline BRCA mutation do not have any family history. And so as a result, you know, given the higher than uh, previously expected rate of uh, germline alterations in patients with pancreas cancer, which is estimated to be about 10%, national guidelines now recommend that any patient who has a confirmed diagnosis of pancreas cancer uh, undergo uh, germline testing. In addition, and I'll discuss in more detail, guidelines also now recommend somatic uh, testing for all patients diagnosed with advanced stage pancreas cancer 
uh, to try to identify uncommon but actionable mutations. So in 2019, another targeted agent was approved, Olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, and it was approved uh, based on this uh, POLO uh, study, which was an international uh, randomized double-blind phase three study, which looked at patients with metastatic pancreas cancer with germline BRCA1-2 mutations who had received at least 16 weeks of uh, platinum therapy without progression. And um, they had to screen over 3,000 patients um, to uh, ultimately enroll uh, over 200 patients with germline BRCA mutation, so a 7.5% um, prevalence. And the primary endpoint in the study was progression-free survival. And so you see they did meet their um, progression-free survival endpoint, uh, so PARP inhibitor uh, improved uh, the PFS to 7.4 months compared to 3.8 months. However, a uh, secondary endpoint of overall survival was not met. And when we look at uh, the final overall survival data, there's still no um, difference in median overall survival, but there is a clinically significant uh, improvement in three-year overall survival with those receiving maintenance elaborate surviving, 34% uh, th of them surviving to three years whereas only 18% uh, of the patients who received placebo were alive at three years. So the next key developments in the treatment um, of pancreas cancer have come from two agnostic drug approaches. NTREC is a gene family that contains three, three members um, and they are rare alterations in, in solid tumors and specifically in pancreas tumor occur in about 1% uh, of pancreatic tumors, but are more common in diseases such as infantile fibrosarcoma or secretary uh, breast cancer. And uh, larachectinib is this highly selective oral in administered inhibitor of NTREC. And what you can see here is an analysis of three open label, label trials, all assessing uh, larachectinib um, in the advanced, for treating advanced solid tumors with, with NTREC gene fusion. And you can see for all comer, all types of tumors with this um, gene fusion, there was a response rate of 79%. And looking at the pancreas uh, cancer population enrolled, there were two patients with pancreatic cancer one of whom had a partial response uh, with a median duration of three and a half months. Similar to larachectinib, entrectinib is also an orally administered NTREC inhibitor. And you can see um, in uh, the analysis of these three studies uh, that the overall response rate was 57%. And there were two patients in this study also with pancreas cancer, one who, who had a partial response and another who had tumor shrinkage. So again, this is just um, showing how uh, somatic mutational profiling can identify these rare but actionable biomarkers and um, be predictive of response to FDA-approved therapy um, for pancreas cancer. So now I want to uh, turn to some of the emerging strategies um, uh, to, to, uh, that we at Sinai are, and elsewhere are exploring. So the microbiome um, is, is a uh, complex communities of trillions of microbes that live on and inside humans. And we know that the combined genetic material from uh, the, the uh, microbiome far exceeds that of the human genome. And the ma majority of the uh, microbiota is found uh, within the GI tract, but of course there are also um, micro microbiota both on the internal and external surfaces of the human body. And we know that um, these micro microbes have co-evolved um, to really help regulate um, health and disease. So they can do this by harvesting otherwise inaccessible nutrients in our diets. They can also um, help with uh, the integrity of mucosal barriers and contributing to the immune system uh, development. Um, and what has been recognized is that dysbiosis or an imbalance in the microbiota can contribute to the pathogenesis of many diseases. And in particular, um, it's been increasingly recognized that uh, the microbiota can contribute to carcinogenesis as well as um, 
play a role in response uh, to chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So with the advent of next generation sequencing, our understanding of the human microbiome has really increased tremendously. And there are a variety of mechanisms that are hypothesized to address how the microbiome influences cancer development, including uh, direct impact of bacterial toxins, um, as well as modulation of the host and systemic immune response. And finally, uh, alteration of microbial and host metabolism. And this can happen in both a uh, direct uh, fashion or local fashion also, uh, versus a remote. So uh, until recently, the pancreas was thought of as a sterile organ and um, it is now well established that this is not the case at all. And so here you can see on the left, uh, a study that looked at over a hundred pancreas tumors and analyzed uh, the bacterial DNA of, of pancreas tumors compared to organ donor pancreas. And you can see that there was a significant increase in bacterial DNA content um, in, the, in the pancreas tumor as compared to the normal pancreas. And in an independent study shown on the right, sim a similar finding was found with uh, increase in uh, bacterial DNA in uh, the tumor uh, pancreas. So we know that there is now uh, bacteria within the pancreas, but what is it doing there? Um, so there is evidence that it's playing a role in oncogenesis. And here you see a um, comparison of pancreas uh, growth in the slowly progressive KC model of pancreas oncogenesis. This is on the left. And so mice with an intact microbiota were compared to those raised in a germ-free environment. And what you can see is that the germ-free mice on the bottom were protected uh, from uh, disease progression and stromal expansion as compared to those uh, raised with their intact microbiota. And then in another model, a more aggressive orthotopic case, KPC model, you can see that um, when treated with antibiotics, this significantly decreased uh, the size of the tumors. So in addition to uh, accelerating pancreas development, pancreatic cancer development, the microbiome has also been shown to uh, play a role in anti-tumor um, immunity. And so here you see um, in a mouse model uh, that when uh, they are, uh, the mice are treated with antibiotics, there's a decrease in uh, myelo-derived suppressor cells, and there's an upregulation of T cell infiltration with an increase in CD8 to CD4 ratio. And these T cells are um, uh, increased in, in activation. And so um, there's a Th1 polarization of CD4 T cells, and there's also a acquisition of a CD8 uh, a cytotoxic CD8 T cell phenotype with upregulation of uh, TBET, interferon gamma, and TNF alpha. What's also seen in, in, um, with microbial evolution with antibiotics is an upregulation of PD1 expression on T cells, as shown up the top left. And so, um, uh, pancreas cancer mice were treated with um, anti PD one by itself, uh, antibiotics by itself, or the combination. And you can see that there was a statistically significant uh, decrease in tumor size with the combination, suggesting that microbial ablation may in fact enable um, efficacy of immunotherapy in pancreas cancer. So in addition to animal data, what's the clinical evidence to support the role of uh, the microbiome in pancreas cancer? So this is a really interesting study done um, by the MD Anderson group looking at long-term survivors of pancreas cancer and short-term survivors. And in their cohort, uh, median survival for the long-term survivors was uh, 10 years and that of the short-term survivors was a little over one and a half years. And what they did was looked at the microbiome composition um, of, of these tumors uh, and compared alpha diversities, the number of species uh, by different methodologies between the short-term and long-term survivors. And you can see that in the long-term survivors, there was a statistically significant increase 
um, in alpha diversity. They then went on to look at the immune composition um, within the pancreases of uh, the long-term versus short-term survivors. And they saw positive correlations of uh, CD3, CD8, and Gramzyme B tissue densities with overall survival. And they also noted uh, that CD8 and Gramzyme B tissue densities correlated with microbiome diversity. The group then wanted to ask, you know, whether modulating the gut microbiome via fecal transplants could affect tumor growth. And so um, they looked uh, at a uh, pancreatic cancer mouse model and treated with antibiotics first, followed by a fecal microbial transplant with either stool from short-term survivors, long-term survivors, or healthy controls. And what you can see on the right is those mice that were transplanted with the stool from the long-term survivors had a significant reduction oops, in their tumor size as compared to the short-term survivors and healthy controls. They also showed that within the tumor, there was upregulation of um, uh, T cells uh, and active t activated T cells uh, in the long-term survivors as compared to the short-term survivors and a downregulation of Tregs and myeloid-derived suppressor cells um, in the long-term survivors. So this really speaks uh, to the fact that, you know, the gut microbiome is able to colonize pancreas tumors and modify its bacterial composition um, to modulate immune function and ultimately affect the natural um, history and survival of pan in pancreas cancer. So it appears you know, that a variety of variables, uh, including genetic alterations in the pancreas, environmental factors like smoking, um, health conditions such as diabetes or gum disease and uh, instrumentation can all contribute to the dysbiosis um, seen. Um, and this altered microbiome um, is hypothesized um, to signal through toll-like receptor signaling leading to immune suppression and ultimate um, pancreas cancer progression. And so within such a model, this really gives us a potential opportunity uh, to try to shift the microbiome community to a more favorable one and really tip the scales to immune activation. Um, and so, you know, this can be done by a variety of mechanisms, including uh, antibiotics, probiotics with either single bacteria or consortia, and of course, uh, fecal microbial transplant. So based on these data, I've designed a, a clinical trial that's really first of its kind in pancreas cancer. Um, and here you see the schema. And this uh, is looking at uh, resectable pancreas cancer patients who receive upfront chemotherapy. And then they will have a new baseline biopsy followed by uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and um, then immune checkpoint inhibition followed by surgical resection. And the primary endpoint um, in sort of this window of opportunity study is to look at changes in the immune composition within the tumor, as well as looking at the changes in the microbiome composition, both in the tumor and the stool. And so um, I'm very excited that hopefully the study is gonna be opening within the next few months. Um, and I'm hopeful that it's gonna shed some light on how uh, manipulating the microbiome may uh, potentially enable efficacy of immunotherapy and really um, open uh, immunotherapy options to the majority of patients, which now, um, you know, it's, it's not really effective. It's only been shown to be effective in the 1% MSI high population. So uh, the microbiome, in addition to it, its effects on oncogenesis and immune modulation, it also has been uh, shown uh, to play a role in chemotherapy resistance. And so what's shown here is a subcutaneous colon cancer model in which luciferous expressly and E. coli were injective, injected and selectively detected um, in uh, the tumors uh, in the mice. And you can see that um, those mice um, that were treated with antibiotics um, displayed a marked anti-tumor um, response to gemcitabine as compared to uh, the control, which uh, showed a rapid progression. And so it is known that the bacterial enzyme cytidine deaminase, uh, which 
can metabolize gemcitabine into its inactive form um, is, um, so they looked at E. coli that were engineered devoid of this enzyme. And you can see um, that when, um, uh, uh, that the E. coli uh, failed to induce drug resistance, um, the, the engineered E. coli uh, without the cytidine deaminase failed to induce drug resistance to gemcitabine. So really um, uh, implying that, that these, uh, that antibiotics can enhance the anti-cancer activity um, of, of gemcitabine. And so con to confirm that the bacteria from human uh, pancreas cancer can mediate gemcitabine resistance, they looked at 65 uh, pancreas tumors and um, looked at their uh, bacterial uh, DNA. And they found that um, in more than half of the uh, samples, uh, they identified a species belonging to the class gamma proteobacteria. And this uh, bacteria expresses the cytidine deaminase uh, enzyme. So they then cultured uh, bacteria from 15 fresh uh, tumors, pancreas tumors, um, with uh, um, uh, two uh, human colon uh, cancer cell lines and found that nearly all of them became fully resistant to gemcitabine suggesting that you know, pancreas tumors do contain bacteria that can modulate the sensitivity to gemcitabine and may play a critical role in mediating, mediating resistance to this drug that we commonly use uh, for treatment. So to explore the oral microbiome, or excuse me, to explore the role of um, the microbiome in pancreas cancer and other GI malignancies, we'll be initiating a observational prospective cohort study um, that's looking at comprehensive omics data, including uh, the gut and oral, bio, my, oral microbiome. Um, and we'll be uh, looking at uh, advanced, patient, advanced uh, GI cancer patients um, and um, using a novel uh, platform for analysis um, with stool uh, metatranscriptomics. And the aims of the study are really just um, to have a preliminary characterization of the diversity and composition of the GI cancer microbiome, and to look at um, some of the changes in the microbiome as a function of both treatment and disease progression. And you know, the hope is that this really is gonna serve as uh, the basis for a larger, uh, more focused study um, in distinct GI cancers um, and, and to kind of tease out the relationship to specific treatment uh, efficacy and toxicity. So now shifting gears to a different sort of personalized medicine, um, that of organoids as a predictive biomarker. Um, you know, the, currently the personalized strategies that are employed um, are, are really, um, you know, genomically based and are serve uh, only to help a minority of our patients. So the thought is that um, individual tumor uh, response testing on patient derived organoids can be um, a better and more widely uh, applicable uh, personalized therapy. And so what are organoids? They're these miniature 3D cell culture models that uh, genotypically and phenotypically um, are similar to the original patient tumor and can recapitulate patient responses to chemotherapeutics. And so um, we have initiated a study led by uh, my colleagues, doctors Eng and Hopkins to look at the 3D organoid model and how it may predict response to neoadjuvant therapy in pancreas cancer. And so um, you see the schema here on the right, but the uh, primary objective is to look, uh, to validate this platform as one that correlates with the clinical pathologic response in these patients and then also to look at whether the organoid response to therapy is predictive to patient outcomes. And now turning to KRAS, which as I discussed at the beginning of the talk is the most commonly mutated gene within pancreas cancer. Um, as you can see at the top right here, in the wild type uh, state, uh, uh, the, the RAS protein cycles between uh, active GTB, GTB bound state and an inactive GDP bound state. Um, and in response to activation of upstream receptor kinases like EGFR, RAS becomes bound to GTP 
um, and is switched on, uh, activating downstream cellular pathways such as RAF network and PI3 kinase. Um, in the oncogenic RAS, um, the, these KRAS mutations lead to impairment of um, GTP hydrolysis um, and can also uh, result in an excess of active, uh, excuse me, also can accelerate GDP to GTP exchange um, and result in a, a excess of active GTP pound um, KRAS uh, that is kind of switched permanently into its active state. So there are multiple activating mutations um, that are seen um, in KRAS that are found in various proportions across different cancer types. And this is showing the distribution within pancreas cancer um, where the most commonly found KRAS mutations are G12D, V, and R. And direct inhibitors have really been very challenging um, to develop in the past due to the shape and structure of uh, the RAS protein. However, uh, new approaches uh, specifically targeting the G12C isoform are changing the treatment landscape and making what have been thought really to be an undruggable target a real, really a viable uh, target now. So KRAS G12C mutations are found uh, in about 1% of pancreatic cancer pa patients, but this subgroup is important to identify given the development of the various G12C inhibitors. And the way these uh, drugs work is they uh, bind uh, covalently uh, with the cysteine uh, and lock the protein into um, an inactive state. And here you see data from uh, two of the KRAS G12C inhibitors um, in pancreatic cancer. And so on the left is sodorasib, um, which uh, showed a primarily a stable disease in, in um, 11 patients. And then on the right is adagrasib, which showed a five out of 10 uh, response rate. Um, so as seen with other small molecule inhibitors, KRAS G12C, uh, inhibition can induce an adaptive resistance um, with loss of negative uh, feedback and uh, upregulation of ERK signaling. And so one potential approach to uh, inhibit uh, the, uh, is to inhibit the guanine, guanine exchange factor, SOS1, um, which uh, is, can shift KRAS into the GDP bound state and thereby potentially augment the ability for G12C inhibitors um, uh, to, to work and, and uh, decrease downstream signaling. So preclinically, uh, G12C inhibitor plus um, uh, the um, SOS1 inhibitor have uh, shown uh, to significantly decrease downstream phospho ERK signaling compared to either agent alone. Um, and this, and the um, SOS1 inhibitor may increase the activity and or durability of um, uh, KRAS G12C inhibitors. Um, so based on, on this um, data, we are um, participating in a phase one study um, in KRAS G12C mutated tumors, all tumors, including pancreatic cancer, looking at adagrasib, a, a G12C inhibitor in combination with a SOS1 inhibitor. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, to see how these uh, drugs are tolerated. So I think uh, you know, we've really come a long way in our understanding of the biology of pancreas cancer and the, and the resulting treatment, including uh, multi-agent chemotherapy, PARP inhibition for germline BRCA mutated uh, patients, immunotherapy in the uh, with pembrolizumab and the MSI high tumors and TREK inhibitors for those uh, patients with uh, NTREK tumors, uh, fusion tumors. And so I think we can you know, easily say that uh, the personal, personalized approach is here and that uh, no longer uh, can we treat patients um, with a one size fits all mentality um, and germline and somatic uh, genetic testing are standard of care. So where do we go from here? I think, you know, in chemotherapy, um, the um, ongoing studies are looking at uh, incorporating second line nanoliposomal arena into the front line. 
There are also ongoing studies looking at adding cisplatin into the doublet combination with gemcitabine, NAB, paclitaxel. And um, there are studies looking at microbiome manipulation and or stratification um, in terms of chemotherapy choice. Uh, uh, the, the DDR pathway is being targeted uh, in a number of ways with combinations uh, like uh, olaparib and um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors or anti-angiogenics. Uh, other uh, DDR pathway inhibitors are being tested in the clinic, such as V1, uh, ATM, and CHECK1. And as key developments in our understanding of the immune system, um, progress, more um, immune landscape, excuse me, in pancreas cancer progress, uh, more active agents are anticipated. And so um, there are some promising areas, including uh, uh, CD40 agonists, uh, CXCR4 antagonists, uh, microbiome manipulation, and um, cellular therapy. And finally, um, with uh, increased tumor profiling, you know, there is an opportunity for further uh, broadening of the targeted therapy approvals. And so that, that testing is ongoing. And I think, you know, moving more of these personalized approaches into the earlier stages, um, such as in the perioperative setting or in the maintenance setting is really, um, something important to, to kind of move, uh, the field forward. So there definitely remain challenges that require unraveling. And I've listed here um, some of the key areas uh, and those include the complex metabolic dysregulation that we see in pancreas cancer, uh, the near impenetrable desmoplasia that is preventing a lot of our treatments from, from accessing the pancreas tumor. Um, targeting of KRAS is going to invariably show new resistance mechanisms um, to the inhibitors in development. And so that will be something that's going to need to be um, uh, unraveled. And then finally, um, early detection and prevention, um, which honestly deserves its entirely own talk. Um, and so, you know, I asked at the beginning, can we make the impossible possible? And so I really do think that we're on the right track with genetic and transcriptional profiling, um, focused on personalized medicine and a more of an investment in um, basic translational and clinical research. Um, and so I really do believe we're on the cups of making huge advancements in this, um, you know, very terrible disease. And so with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, my uh, GI uh, medicine, surgery, and oncology colleagues, as well as my laboratory uh, collaborators, both here and at NYU, and then um, the funding support I've received. And I uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. There are, there are some, uh, we have a moment for questions. It's at the end of the hour, but um, there's, um, question in the chat that says there was a study in science a few years ago in mouse in a mouse model showing that decreasing fibrosis made the pancreatic cancer sensitive to chemotherapy. Has there been follow-up in humans? Yeah, so there, there have been, you know, studies like with, with hyaluronidase uh, inhibitors, um, which have not um, been successful. Um, there are other agents currently um, in clinical trials um, that we're awaiting, uh, you know, readouts from. But as of now, um, you know, again, that's one of the, the challenging areas is um, the dense desmoplasia and how um, we can uh, kind of reverse that. Is there anything you can comment on about liquid biopsies and have they been useful? Yeah, so I mean, we're at just the beginning of understanding um, liquid biopsies. And in fact, I didn't actually should have included that here. We are uh, launching a study looking at uh, sort of the um, uh, response to uh, preoperative uh, therapy, or looking at the dynamics of circulating tumor DNA. Um, in, in response to preoperative therapy, and then you know looking at outcomes um, in terms of surveillance uh, using this mechanism, but it's still being studied, and so um, it's sort of in its early days. Gotcha. Um, and then there's a question about any role um, for urolithin A. 
I am not familiar with that, so I don't know the answer. Gotcha. That's good. Good response there. <laughs> and then um, how about um, would you take this approach in a 95-year-old? And this question came in towards the very end. Yeah, I'm not sure which approach, um, but, you know, I guess, would I treat a patient with uh, who, you know, it's, it's not all about age, as everyone knows, right? There's there's biologic age and, and there's uh, you know, actual age. So, you know, we, we kind of have to take things case by case. Um, but I'm not entirely sure which approach we're, we're talking about there. You mean a logic she just wrote? Uh, you mean, uh, so certainly in a, uh, an MSI high patient, one could consider, you know, a, 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 not a patient, but a tumor patient with an MSI high tumor, one could consider treating, uh, with, uh, PD-1 inhibitor. It's relatively, um, you know, the adverse events are relatively low and mainly, you know, in terms of like rare, uh, autoimmune side effects, but, um, you know, depends on what the patient's comorbidities are. Well, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for uh, this very comprehensive talk around pancreatic um, cancers. It was really terrific. So thanks very much. And uh, have a nice day, everyone. Thanks for coming to Grand Rounds. See you all soon. Thanks, Deirdre.